Hello, and welcome to this final lecture in this virtual lecture course on electromagnetism. I'm Dr. Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture, we'll be talking about relativity in the theory of electromagnetism. This lecture will really be the culmination of all the different topics we've been discussing in this course, bringing them together into one unified framework. We'll be using uh, many concepts from special relativity, and in the first part of this lecture, I want to do a bit of a revision and a reminder about uh, concepts uh, in special relativity, in particular, the concepts of four vectors. Four vectors are objects which transform under the full symmetry operations of the Poincaré group. So not just translations and rotations of our coordinate system, but also Lorentz boosts along a given direction, meaning a relative velocity between different inertial reference frames. So this is a wider kind of symmetry which can be incorporated into our description of physical phenomena, and in particular here into the description of electrodynamics. Four vectors can be contracted into so-called Lorentz scalars, which are relativistic invariants. They're the same in all reference frames, and this is something we want for the principle of relativity. So we'll be describing all of these important concepts at the beginning part of this lecture, and then in the second part of the lecture, applying them to Maxwell's equations and the, uh, the theory of electrodynamics. In particular, we'll be able to derive uh, a relativistically invariant or covariant form of Maxwell's equations involving the potentials. But these equations will feature four vectors. They're the four vectors we're interested in in electrodynamics will be, for example, the four potential, which has an, in its components the scalar potential, but also the vector potential in one single object. We'll also look at the four current, which contains both the charge density and the current density as its components, again combined into one object. So relativity allows us to, to combine the different aspects of electrodynamics, both the, the electric side and the magnetic side, on an equal footing in single four-vector equations. Of course, Maxwell's equations are actually already incorporating the effects of special relativity, but when we formulate it in terms of four vectors, we'll see a deeper structure and we'll see that this has uh, much, much greater power. We'll also see um, and use the idea of gauge transformations of the potentials. And we'll see how we can perform a Lorentz transformation between different reference frames. And although the equations themselves remain the same, the kind of physical effects uh, may have different interpretations. So to one observer, we may regard a certain phenomena as being a magnetic effect, but to a different inertial observer, that same physical thing might be regarded as an electric effect. So this deeper understanding of the phenomena is revealed by this relativistic formulation. Finally, I want to talk about Lagrangian formulation of electrodynamics. And this really draws very heavily from our relativistic formulation. We'll see that with some grand and overarching principles of locality, of Lorentz invariance, of gauge invariance, we can cook up a Lagrangian for electromagnetism. This Lagrangian can then be used with the principle of least action, and from the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion, we'll see that we recover Maxwell's equations. So this draws together and unifies everything that we've been discussing into one very powerful framework. And that's the topic of this lecture, and it's the last topic in this course. So let's get down to work. So in this lecture, we'll be discussing relativity, uh, that is to say Einstein's special relativity, in the context of electromagnetism. So this relativistic formulation of electromagnetism is somewhat technical. However, it does reveal the deeper structures to the theory of electromagnetism, particularly in the dynamical case. We'll see that it's extremely powerful and a wonderfully elegant theory. In particular, it allows us to change inertial reference frames and consider the effect on uh, the electrodynamics. And what we'll see is that electricity and magnetism are intertwined, and that, indeed, 
um, the concepts of electricity and magnetism as uh, distinct phenomena really depends on the reference frame. So before we get started, I just want to mention that in this lecture, we're going to use the minus plus 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 signature. Um, the meaning of that will be explained in due course. Okay, so before we get into the discussion of relativity as it applies to uh, electromagnetism, let's review and revise some features of special relativity, and in particular, uh, the concept of four vectors. Of course, there are many things to be said about this, and uh, that's the focus, in fact, of the entire course on classical mechanics and relativity. However, um, what I want to do here is just sort of summarize in a concise way the technical details. So I won't provide an explanation for this. Uh, I won't provide a derivation. Uh, I will simply just present the, in the simplest possible way, all the things that we're going to need, the technical and mathematical machinery behind four vectors and special relativity, Lorentz transformations, contractions, uh, Lorentz scalars, and all of this good stuff. <clears throat> so the discussion of special relativity and four vectors begins with the concept of a space-time event. So a space-time event occurs at a particular point in space, meaning we have to specify x, y, and z coordinates in 3D space, but also at a particular time. So altogether, we have four components, one for time and three for space. This is encoded in a so-called space-time event four vector. This four vector is denoted by x superscript mu. This Greek index mu runs over the four components of this four vector. And uh, by convention, the time component is called the zeroth component. So x zero is ct, whereas these three spatial coordinates are the space-like components. And they essentially form the usual position vector. And so we have x1 is x, capital X2 is y, and capital X3 is z. <clears throat> and of course, this can also be something that can be just written as a usual uh, three-dimensional standard uh, vector r. Notice also that the time component is multiplied by the speed of light. And this is um, this can be thought of as kind of a unit choice. We want uh, in this four vector all of these components to have the same units. So if we're going to put time in there, we need to multiply it by velocity. And the velocity we choose is the speed of light. Choosing the speed of light, of course, is a particular choice of units, and they're the sensible units to choose in special relativity because there is a, there is a certain symmetry uh, which connects the space and time-like components. That's the uh, Lorentz symmetry. Uh, so we want to choose basically the same kind of units, and it turns out that the units we need to choose um, uh, dictates that we use the speed of light there. Uh, to use anything other than c for the velocity, um, would be equivalent to saying, let's measure the x direction in meters and the y direction in feet or something like that. We want to choose something that's actually the same, uh, on the same footing for all four components of our four vector. Now, this is a so-called contravariant four vector. And there's an alternative type of vector called a covariant four vector, which is very closely related. In special relativity, this takes a very particular form, and it's extremely simple. We just see that the time-like component, the zeroth component of the four vector, picks up this additional minus sign. There is a deep, uh, more technical distinction be between contravariant and covariant four vectors, uh, but I don't want to get into that here. Also notice that if we were to um, go to general relativity, uh, the difference between contravariance and co covariant four vectors uh, would be different. So here, let me just specify that what we're talking about is uh, special relativity. So again, the only difference here 
in special relativity between the contravariant and covariant fall vectors is that the time component gets an extra minus sign. And this is all we need to know for this particular course. Of course, we could dig deeper into the subtleties, but we won't do that uh, in this lecture. So we have four vectors with an upper index called contravariant four vectors and uh, four vectors with a lower index called covariant four vectors. And we can actually convert between the contravariant and covariant four vectors backwards and forwards uh, by so-called lowering the index or raising the index. And that is done in the following way. We can lower the index uh, using this expression in which we contract uh, the contravariant four vector here uh, with this Minkowski metric tensor uh, eta mu nu. And I'll explain what that means and how to deal with it in a moment. But before I do that, let me just say that raising the index has a similar kind of structure. We can get a contravariant four vector from a covariant four vector similarly, similarly by this kind of contraction. So there's two things we need to know here. First of all, what does this notation mean? And secondly, what is this metric tensor eta? So here we actually used the famous Einstein summation convention, which tells you that whenever you see the product of two four vectors with the same index repeated, one of them a lower index and one of them an upper index, it's implied that we're actually supposed to sum over the four values that this index can take. So, for example, what is actually meant by this lowering the index equation here is actually the sum of nu goes from 0 to 3 of eta mu nu x new. And that's because on the left hand side here, we have the product of two terms. One of them has uh, a lower index new, and one of them has an upper index new. And this is a repeated index, one of them lower and one of them upper. And so it's implied that we sum over the four values that new can take, and new runs from zero to three. And so in this expression, um, we sum over new, and we'll, we do that for a given mu, and mu is something that's left undetermined, so that's still a variable, an index, and that is the only index that survives on the left-hand side of the expression. On the left-hand side, we cannot have a new, because new is being summed over. We just have the mu on the left-hand side. And likewise, for raising the index we see that there's a repeated new, one upper and one lower, and so this implies that we sum over new, leaving just this mu left over, which ends up on the left-hand side. So of course here we've been talking about four vectors, which uh, the event four vector is denoted with this capital X and a single index, mu or new, some other Greek letter perhaps, uh, which can either be upstairs or downstairs, but I've sort of swept under the rug a little bit the idea of this object, this eta, this has two indices, and so it's a tensor rather than a vector. But the same logic applies. So this eta mu nu is the so-called Minkowski metric tensor, and it describes the geometry of flat 4D spacetime. If we were going to general relativity, then this would take a more general form. It would not be flat spacetime, but curved spacetime. But in special relativity that we're going to talk about today in the context of electrodynamics, um, we're just going to use the flat space-time Minkowski metric tensor. And for the purposes of this lecture, and you can of course delve into this in more detail and understand the subtleties, but for the purposes of this lecture, we can just understand this metric tensor, which is something with two indices, as being like a matrix, which has two indices for the rows and columns of the matrix. And specifically, in this particular signature, we have the following. So we can regard this as just a diagonal matrix with minus one as the zero zeroth component, and then plus ones for the one one, two two, 
and three three components, and everything else is zero. And again, this relates to what I said at the beginning of the lecture, that in this lecture we're going to talk about the physics in minus plus 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 signature. And you can see what that means now. This signature is referring to the diagonal elements of this metric tensor. Uh, we could also have chosen a different signature. Another popular one is plus, minus, minus, minus. Um, that's just like an overall minus sign. and doesn't really make any difference. However, we have to have a convention and stick to it. And the one we're going to use is this convention. And so we can see that this is almost the identity matrix, but we have a negative sign in the 0, 0 entry, which encodes the difference between covariant and contravariant four vectors. So when we raise or lower the indices, this uh, extra minus sign has to crop up, and that's encoded in this metric tensor. Notice also that the metric tensor with the upper indices is just exactly the same as the metric tensor with the lower indices. And that's basically all we need. So when we think about raising or lowering the indices, we actually just doing essentially a matrix product of a uh, column, a four-dimensional column vector with this four by four matrix eta. On a sort of technical or mathematical level, that's the way we can view the, the algebra here. But in the end, because eta is a diagonal matrix, which is so simple, uh, actually it turns out that the difference between the contravariant and covariant vectors is really just this minus sign on the time-like component. So having defined now our contravariant and covariant four vector for the event in space-time, we can ask a deeper question, which is, what is really a four vector? Is it just an array of four numbers? Well, no, it is something very specific. A four vector is an object that transforms under the Lorentz transformations. In fact, it transforms under the full symmetry operations of the Poincaré group meaning that it's uh, translations in space, rotations in space, and also the Lorentz transformations. So just as we would define a vector in normal three-dimensional space as something that transforms under uh, translations of uh, our coordinate system and rotations of our coordinate system, likewise, four vectors are very specific objects that transform under these symmetry operations, as well as the Lorentz transformations. And of course, Einstein showed that this uh, four vector event that we considered on the previous slide is such an object. But that does not mean to say that any uh, old array of four numbers uh, or four quant physical quantities would constitute a four vector. They have to transform in the proper way. And there are actually many different kinds of four vectors that appear in the theory of uh, electromagnetism, and there are also different four tensors that we will consider. And so we need to understand the transformation properties of these things to confirm that these things are indeed four vectors. So what is the Lorentz transformation in special relativity? Well, the Lorentz transformation allows us to change our inertial reference frame. We go from a particular reference frame to a different reference frame related to the previous one just in terms of a constant relative velocity. Converting from one reference frame to another is done using the Lorentz transformation, as Einstein taught us. And the Lorentz transformation of four vectors takes the following form. So let's try to unpack this equation. On the right-hand side, we see a contravariant four vector in a particular inertial frame, which I'll call S. Here, we're doing this example for uh, a contravariant four-vector, which is the space-time event four-vector, but we'll see that this same uh, transformation equation applies for any four-vector. We see in here a repeated index, nu, of two objects, one with a lower index, one with an upper index, and so here we have the Einstein summation convention, and that is a sum over nu equals 0, 1, 2, and 3. On the right-hand side, we see the contravariant four-vector 
in a different inertial frame which we'll call s primed and the fact that I'm calling this s primed is denoted here by the fact that we have a prime uh, symbol uh, on this contravariant four vector that tells us that we're in the primed reference frame and finally what is this object here so this requires a bit of uh, further explanation this is the so-called uh, Lorentz transformation tensor And for the, for the purposes here, we can just regard these things with two indices as uh, a matrix uh, with uh, the mu here denoting the rows and the nu denoting the columns. Now, this object looks a little bit funny because whilst we have two indices, we see one of them is upper and one of them is lower. But don't be phased by that. For the purposes of this uh, lecture, we can just regard this thing as a matrix. Given that mu and nu, these Greek indices, run over four components, zero time and one, two, three for space, this object is a four by four matrix. Or it can be viewed as a four by four matrix. Again, there's some subtleties behind the scenes here that I, I don't think we need to get into for this discussion. So what is this 4x4 four four matrix? It is this object. It is something that has a block diagonal structure. we can sort of imagine dividing this up into these blocks. And the non-trivial part is occurring in this two by two block in the upper left-hand corner. The two by two block in the lower right-hand corner is just the two by two identity matrix and is kind of passive. So some words of explanation are in order here. In particular, this is a transformation for a Lorentz boost along the x-axis. And we can see that because the time-like components of this matrix, uh, which are the zeroth row and the zeroth column, are getting scrambled up with the x-direction uh, space-like components, which occur in the one column and the one row. That's what's happening here in this, in this two by two block of this matrix transformation. So when we talk about Lorentz boost, what that means is that the two inertial frames, S and S primed, are related by a constant relative velocity along the x direction. And we can denote that uh, Vx. It has to be a constant relative velocity because they should both be inertial reference frames. And therefore, if S is inertial, then S primed is also inertial. So this is a specific uh, uh, transformation for a relative velocity along the x direction. Uh, and that's all we'll actually consider in this lecture. But please note that if you considered any other direction, uh, that's simply related to this matrix by a trivial uh, rotation of the uh, coordinate uh, system. So all of the non-trivial stuff is contained already in this transformation. Uh, we can always just consider uh, a relative velocity along some other arbitrary direction by performing this transformation and then doing a subsequent rotation. The other thing we need to know to be able to understand this uh, transformation property is what these parameters are in here, gamma and beta. So this combination here is minus beta times gamma. This is the same gamma. So we need to know what beta and gamma are. So beta is the, for the relative velocity between inertial frames S and S primed in units of the speed of light. And here we're talking about velocity uh, along the x direction, relative velocity along the x direction. Gamma 
is the so-called Lorentz factor, which is 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared, where this is the same beta that I just defined. So if we know the relative velocity between s and s primed, we can work out beta and gamma, and then, of course, we just put them into this expression for the Lorentz transformation tensor, which, as I say, can be viewed as a 4x4 four four matrix. One question that might arise is which of these two indices here, the mu and the nu, refers to the rows and the columns of this matrix, and the answer is that it doesn't matter because this matrix is a symmetric matrix. So whether we choose rows or columns for the first and second indices here doesn't matter. So just don't worry about that. So here is that information summarized again. Let's just do a quick example of this. Suppose that I want to know the x coordinate in the primed reference frame. That is equal to the 4 vector uh, with the 1 component in the primed reference frame, which can be related by the Lorentz transformation to the 4 vector in the unprimed reference frame in this way, where in this equation I simply used that because I'm interested in the x component, that's the 1 component of the 4 vector, and that means mu is equal to 1, and therefore on the right-hand side, I, instead of writing mu, I just write 1. But we still have this sum over nu, which is basically a matrix product, and I just sum over the four values of nu in that expression from 0 to 3, And in this matrix, I pick, for example, I say that this first index is, uh, let's say it's the row, so it's this row here, the first row, remembering that the numbering starts from zero. This is zero, one, two, three. So the way to read this is that this is the first row. And then we sum over the four values for the column index with this uh, new here, one, two, three, four. And so, the way we unpack this is to say, first of all, it's uh, lambda 1, 0 times x, 0, and so on. Lambda 1, 1, x, 1. Lambda 1, 2, x, 2. And lambda 1, 3, x, 3. These last two contributions are 0 because uh, lambda 1, 2 featuring here is this element, which is 0, and lambda 1, 3 is this element, which is 0. In this expression, we have that x0 is, of course, ct, and x1 is, of course, just x in the unprimed reference frame. And so, putting it together, we learn that x primed is equal to uh, ct times lambda 1, 0, which is minus beta gamma. Plus x lots of lambda 1, 1, which is this term, which is gamma. Or put another way x primed is equal to gamma into x minus uh, v t. And I got v t here because I'm multiplying c by beta, beta being v over t. And of course, that's what we know from the Lorentz transformation. And you can work through the other equations uh, very similarly uh, and convince yourself that this is correct. Now, if you don't like all of this index notation, uh, you can actually just think of this as a straightforward matrix product regarding these various objects, for example, this lambda thing, just as a 4 by 4 matrix, and then the four vectors simply as a sort of 4 by 1, if you like, column matrix. So that really simply just looks like this, 
So here I have the uh, x mu primed, here I have x mu, and here I have the lambda Lorentz transformation matrix. So if I want the x primed element, that is the second element in here, the second row, and so by matrix multiplication, I multiply the second row of this matrix by this column, and indeed, and indeed, this is the term that I generate. So you can think about this in terms of matrix products if you want to do that. Of course, what I've written down here is the Lorentz transformation for the contravariance of four vectors. So what is the corresponding Lorentz transformation for the covariant four vectors? Well, the easiest way to do this is simply to relate the covariant four vectors to the contravariant four vectors using the raising and lowering operators that we already discussed, uh, and then simply use this transformation. So what do I mean by that? I simply mean that if I want to know x mu, which is a covariant, four vector in the primed reference frame, I can just relate that to a contravariant four vector in the primed reference frame. So all of this is in the primed reference frame. And actually, this is just equivalent to uh, then lowering the index of x nu in the prime reference frame. And that's because this Minkowski metric tensor does not depend on the reference frame. So this, there's, there's no effect of having this inside this, uh, this primed thing here. That's the same in all reference frames. And now I have this object, which is a contravariant four vector in the primed reference frame. I can now just go ahead and use the Lorentz transformation expression at the top of this slide, except I just have a prefactor of eta mu nu sitting out the front. Also have to just be a little bit careful because I've already used the index nu uh, for the lowering of the index. So here I'm going to use another Greek index sigma. It doesn't matter which index I use because according to the Einstein summation convention, this is being summed over, the nu is being summed over, the only thing that survives is mu, and that's the thing that appears on the left side of the expression. So here I have a Lorentz transformation of the covariant four vector um, in the primed reference frame, uh, and it relates to a contravariant four vector in the unprimed frame. So if I wanted to find a full expression relating the covariant four vector in the prime frame to the covariant four vector in the unprimed frame, there is one more step that I need to do, uh, which is to lower the index on the right hand side. So here I have eta mu nu, lambda nu sigma, and then here I want to lower this index, and so I would have uh, sigma, let's call it gamma, and x gamma. So this looks a little bit complicated, but it's uh, really not so bad. Um, I just have these th three products of things. Nu is being summed over, sigma is being summed over, and gamma is being summed over. On the right-hand side, I have the covariance four vector in the unprimed frame, and on the left-hand side, I have the covariant four vector in the primed frame. Uh, instead of writing out this triple product here, um, because these are all constant uh, matrices, if you like, and I know what they are, I can just do that once uh, and for all and just work it out. And just by using the usual raising and lowering operators, um, I know that this whole thing is basically equivalent to this thing. Uh, 
where the which uh, the the index which is upper and the index which has been lower is uh, has now been swapped, and you can just plug that in and work it out, and you can find uh, that without too much effort that this object, which is a four by four object, is very similar to the previous one, except without the minus signs on the 0, 1, and 1, 0 elements. So it's not so mysterious. So what I mean in the end, just going through this algebra, is this expression, which then relates a covariant four vector in the prime frame to a covariant four vector in the unprimed frame. So hopefully it's clear how to apply the Lorentz transformation for four vectors uh, and also use the Einstein summation convention and raising and lowering operators from these examples. So now that we have the event four vector, x mu, what other kind of four vectors can we generate? Well, one thing that we can do straight away is to define a four gradient. And the four gradient is defined as the derivative with respect to the components of a four vector. And notice that the one that I've written down here on the left-hand side has a lower index mu, and therefore this is a covariant four vector. The definition of that is the derivative with respect to the contravariant event. And the simple rule of thumb here for remembering this is that here we have an index which is lower and it's lower because we see on the right-hand side that the index is in the denominator here. Of course, there's a proper reason for that, but I, I won't go into it here. So just to spell out what this thing actually means, therefore, it would be 1 over c of d by dt, and then d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. And again, we can separate that out into time-like component and space-like components. The vector, the three-dimensional vector of the spatial derivatives is, of course, this uh, gradient operator uh, denoted by this, with this standard Nabla symbol, symbol that we've been seeing many, many times in this course on electromagnetism. So this four gradient involves the derivatives with respect to time and also with respect to space. And similarly, we can define a contravariant four vector, which in the expected notation would have the index uh, upper. This means d by dx with a lower index, slightly confusingly. And that means, as you might expect, that it has a minus sign on the time-like component of the vector. And it follows the same rule that we can raise and lower the index to go from the contravariant to the covariant four vector. So just to spell that out, using the Einstein summation convention, I can write this because here, again, I have the product of two things, one with an upper index and one with a lower index, and that index is repeated. And so I sum over nu, and I'm left with mu, which appears on the left-hand side. And likewise, I can convert the other way. Uh, using this expression. So uh, here 
we have introduced the uh, the four gradient, which is certainly a four vector, if the event is a four vector, uh, because this four gradient just involves derivatives with respect to the components of the event four vector. So here we've generated a new four vector. It's called the four gradient. We can also do a Lorentz transformation of our four gradient. And we do that in exactly the same way as we did for the Lorentz transformation of the event four vector. Namely, let's take the contravariant gradient four gradient in the primed reference frame, that's equal to this expression which involves the contravariant four gradient in the unprimed reference frame. And again remember that the Einstein summation convention here impl implies doing the sum over the new variable here leaving the mu variable uh, alone on the left-hand side. And if I want to know the Lorentz transformation of the covariant four gradient, which is given by the gradient uh, in the prime reference frame with the lower index, I can simply lower the index from the previous expression, where here I'm using the Greek index sigma to be summed over, which can then be written out in this way. And this relates the covariant four gradient in the primed reference frame to the contravariant four gradient in the unprimed frame. But if I wanted to express the covariant four gradient in the prime frame to the covariant four vector in the unprimed frame, then I have to again do a lowering of the index on the right hand side, which yields this. And precisely as we saw before, from the Lorentz transformation of the event four vector, I can absorb all of this stuff into the definition of uh, a Lorentz transformation um, matrix, which looks like this, one with the mu index lower and one with the new index upper. So here we've discussed two different types of four vectors. One is the four vector for the event, and the other is the four vector for the gradient. We've discussed raising and lowering the indices between contravariance and covariance, backwards and forwards, and also the idea of doing a Lorentz transformation between different inertial reference frames. The last very important thing I want to talk about before we get back to electromagnetism is the concept of a Lorentz scalar. Lorentz scalars are objects which are the same in all inertial reference frames. They're relativistic invariants. And they can be obtained by doing a generalized inner product, which is something like the usual vector dot product, uh, between one contravariant and one covariant four vector. So let's see what this means. Let's do an example. using the event four vector. And we form a product which is the equivalent of a dot product for, for usual three vectors, one with uh, the covariant four vector here, and one with the contravariant four vector. But notice importantly, we have the same Greek index, one lower and one upper, and so, this implies the Einstein summation convention over mu over all the four components from zero to three. And the only difference between the contravariant and the covariant four vectors uh, in special relativity is the minus sign on the time-like component. And so when we perform this product, we will get minus c squared t squared the minus precisely coming from this difference between the uh, contravariant and covariant four vectors, plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And this object is kind of like the usual Pythagorean theorem, except in four dimensions, 
with the fourth dimension being time, and entering with this funny minus sign. Let's do another example. We could look at the contraction, so-called, of the gradients. Again, this implies the uh, Einstein summation convention. I won't bother writing it out again. It's always the same. And it's exactly the same as before. We get this extra minus sign on the time-like component and plus signs on the space-like components. And in this case, because this is an operator, we see that this object uh, is actually the sum of these second derivatives where the time-like component has this minus 1 over c squared part. And this is exactly the definition of this D'Alembertian, the so-called box, so we call this box squared, where just for emphasis, these three second derivatives with respect to the spatial components uh, are, of course, uh, the Laplacian. So this object is a Lorentz scalar. This box squared operator is the same in all reference frames. And indeed, contracting two four vectors in this way always yields something that is a relativistic invariant, something that is the same in all reference frames. And that is the important and powerful point about uh, these objects. So let's prove that important property. To do that, let's consider this object in the primed reference frame. Now, we can individually do a Lorentz transformation on both of these objects into the unprimed reference frame, and we'd obtain this, where the uh, first factor here, which is the covariant four vector in the primed reference frame, is given by the Lorentz transformation of the contravariant four vector in the unprimed frame here, and the second factor for the contravariant four vector in the primed reference frame is given by Lorentz transformation in terms of the contravariant four vector in the unprimed frame. So just sort of tidying up the algebra a bit here, we can sort of pull out all of these transformation matrices, like so. And then we're left with the two uh, contravariant four vectors in the unprimed frame themselves. And we can just go ahead and work out what this object is. And I'll leave that to you as an exercise, uh, but it can pretty easily be shown that when you work all of that out, you actually get eta, being careful with the indices, sigma lambda. So all of this is eta, sigma lambda of x sigma x lambda. So what does this mean? We have a repeated index of sigma here, one upper and one lower, and we also have a repeated index of lambda, one upper and one lower. And so that means that we sum over everything. Or another way of putting it is that we can, re is that we can actually lower the index of uh, this uh, x sigma here, and we'd obtain uh, simply x lambda as a covariant four vector and x lambda as a contravariant four vector, and we still have one sum to perform. Uh, and obviously, what we've now shown is that the contraction of these two four vectors in the primed frame is equal to the contraction of the four vectors in the unprimed frame. Here I have uh, a sum over lambda, and here I have a sum over mu, but that doesn't matter. That's just a dummy index uh, over which I'm summing. The important point is that the, ob the, the result of this summation is the same in the two frames. And here I actually made no um, special reference or use of the particular four vector in question. I only utilized its transformation properties. I did not say anything about the specific Lorentz transformation. I simply encoded it in these very general matrices. So as a very general property,
we see that these kinds of contractions over two four vectors will be sum over their components, one upper and one lower, and these things are the same in all reference frames. And obviously that's very important because if the principle of relativity is to be uh, upheld, then we know that uh, the physics in all reference frames should be the same. Therefore, we know, for example, that the Lagrangian of the system must contain only Lorentz scalars. So more on that later. So let me just summarize the result here. For any four vector, if I form this inner product in the prime frame, it's equal to the analogous inner product of the same four vectors in the unprimed frame. And this, of course, means that they're the same in all reference frames. OK, so with that background technical information in mind, let's now explore the implications of all of this for electromagnetism, which is, of course, the topic of this course. And let's first consider the famous continuity equation describing local charge conservation. In the previous lectures, we derived the continuity equation from first principles. We didn't have to use anything from electromagnetism. We just used the simple fact that charge is indestructible and moves from one place to another in a continuous fashion. And we were able to derive the following very important equation, which relates the time derivative of the charge density rho to the current density j through its divergence. And we see that the sum of these two terms, d rho by dt, and the divergence of j, must always be equal to zero due to charge conservation. So a decrease in the charge in a particular region is due to the flow of the charge or a current through the walls of the region. And this equation must be true in all reference frames since it encodes a physical conservation law. The conservation law cannot change depending on whether or not I am moving relative to the, to the physical phenomena in question. So with this equation, we would argue, because we derived it from first principles and it embodies a conservation law, must be something that is relativistically invariant. So the important consequence is that if this equation holds in all reference frames, we must be able to cast it in the form of a four vector equation in which we have a contraction to produce a Lorentz scalar, because we know Lorentz scalars are the things that are invariant to changes in reference frame. So let me write down the four vector equation uh, version of the continuity equation. This equation is precisely equivalent to this equation. where we have um, a few things to note here. First of all, this object is uh, manifestly a Lorentz scalar because we have two four vectors, um, one of them a contravariant, one of them covariant with lower and upper indices. And uh, we have the same index here, which is being summed over due to the Einstein summation convention. And we just uh, we're at lengths to prove that those things do not depend on the reference frame. Here, uh, in this expression, we have the covariant 4 gradient, which we've just been talking about. So this object is 1 over c d by dt um, in, the, in the zero or time-like component of the 4 vector. And then the gradient operator, d by dx, d by dy, d by dz, um, in the spatial components. What is this j object? This is a new four vector, which I have introduced here. And it must be equal to c times rho, the charge density in the zero or time-like component of the four vector, 
And then it must just be equal to the current, the standard current in the space-like components. If the two equations that I've written down here, the continuity equation in its usual form, and this four vector equation are to be equivalent. So the C, the one over C here and the C cancels there. We have D by DT of rho, that's the first term. And then when we take the dot product of the gradient operator and J, of course, that's just the divergence. So this equation with this definition is exactly equal to the continuity equation. And furthermore, um, because we have the Einstein summation convention over here, and one of them is a lower index and one of them is an upper index, we know that this object must be relativistically invariant. And that actually is sufficient to prove that this object J that I've written down here is a bona fide genuine four vector. And that object is referred to as the four current. And in this way, we've been able to obtain a new type of four vector. We know that this J, uh, which comprises one component um, of the charge density and three components of the current density. Now, when we put those together in this particular way, noting also this dimension here with this uh, uh, mul multiplication by C, this is a four vector and we call it the four current. Because we know that J is a four vector, and we know what a four vector is, the definition of a four vector is something that transforms under the Lorentz transformation. We now know how the four current will transform um, when we change reference frame. In particular, we'll be able to say what happens to the charge density and current density when we change reference frame. So this is a big step forward, which we essentially get for free using this uh, machinery. So what is the Lorentz transformation of the four current? Uh, we know that j mu in a primed reference frame will just be equal to this expression. Uh, where on the right hand side here, we have the contravariance for current in the unprimed reference frame. And as usual, we do this contraction over the repeated index nu. So let's do a quick example of this in use. Let's consider, for example, the, let's say the X component of the current in the primed reference frame. How is that related to the charge density and currents of the unprimed reference frame? Well, we know that JX primed is equal to the one component, J1, of the uh, of the four current in the primed reference frame, and that in turn is equal to this object, which involves the sum over nu from zero to three of one, the one newth component of the Lorentz transformation tensor lambda times uh, j nu. And we go back to our definition of the lambda, uh, which can basically be thought of as a four by four matrix. And we just plug it in and work it out. And we find this. Where on the right hand side, we have the uh, x component of the current in the unprimed reference frame. But we also see the charge density of the unprimed reference frame appearing on the right hand side. Gamma, as usual, is the Lorentz factor, and V here is the relative velocity between our two reference frames. So this is not, there's no physical particle moving with velocity V. This is us moving with a, part, with a velocity V. It's the difference in the velocity, the relative velocity of the reference frames. And we see that the current gets modified as we change reference frame. And that's actually natural because as we move along relative to our system, it appears that a static charge distribution is moving and that const constitutes a current. And indeed, uh, what you'd expect perhaps from a Galilean transformation would simply be uh, Jx minus V rho. Uh, but of course, being relativity, we pick up this extra factor 
of, um, of gamma, the Lorentz factor. So we see something non-trivial emerging in these uh, transformation equations, um, and we get all of this basically for free just using the machinery of special relativity applied in the context of electromagnetism. The conclusion of this is that the components of the four current get scrambled up and mixed together when we change our reference frame. And that's not at all intuitive. So now I want to introduce a different type of four vector, the so-called four potential. So what I will do here is simply uh, introduce as like a, an assumption or an ansatz, a, a particular form for this four potential in terms of the scalar and vector potentials that we've been working with uh, earlier in this course. I will then just take this, uh, this assumption and then explore the consequences of that. And then in the end, uh, that will justify the choice of this four potential that I write down. So without further ado, what is this four potential? Let's introduce a, a contravariant four potential a mu, where in the time-like component, we have one over C of the scalar potential. And then in the space-like components, we'll have the three components of the usual uh, three component vector potential. And at the moment, let's just posit this as an assumption. Okay, so let's explore the consequences of this. First of all, let's remind ourselves how the magnetic uh, and electric fields are related to the usual components of the potential. So from the last lecture, we know that the magnetic field B is given by the curl of the usual vector potential, whereas the electric field E is given by minus the gradient of the scalar potential minus the time derivative of the vector potential. That's what we had from the last lecture. And we also had the concept of a gauge transformation. And a gauge transformation is something where you can alter or change in some way the uh, scalar potential and vector potential in a very specific way such that it leaves the electric and magnetic fields alone. As we discussed in the last lecture, this corresponds to a kind of local symmetry of the problem. So let's remind ourselves of the gauge transformations. We can write down, let's say, a new vector potential in terms of the old vector potential plus the gradient of some scalar field psi, and for the scalar potential, I can write the new scalar potential in terms of the old scalar potential minus the time derivative of the same scalar field psi, where, just to emphasize this, this psi is a proper field that exists everywhere in space and at all times. And we can choose anything we like for this scalar field psi, as long as it's twice differentiable with respect to the spatial uh, coordinates and the time. We then chose a specific gauge, the so-called Lorentz gauge. And in the Lorentz gauge, uh, by definition of the Lorentz gauge, we choose that the divergence of the vector potential is exactly cancelled by 1 over c squared of the time derivative of the scalar potential. That's a choice that we make. It's a gauge fixing procedure. But whatever gauge we choose, we know that it's not going to affect the physical observables. That's the whole point of this gauge transformation. OK, so why am I talking about these gauge transformations? Why is that important? Well, if we look in the Lorentz gauge, we know from the last lecture that Maxwell's equations reduce to 
a pair of inhomogeneous wave equations in terms of the potentials. We have one equation for the vector potential in terms of the regular current, and we have one equation for the scalar potential in terms of the regular charge density. Let me just rewrite that second equation for the charge density a little bit differently. Let me just divide through by C through the whole equation, and then I'll use the fact that um, mu naught epsilon naught is 1 over C squared, and I'll get the following. Okay, so just a very small modification there to the way in which I write the equation. The equation itself is the same, I just divided through by C. Now these equations can actually now be rewritten in an even simpler form by using this uh, box squared notation, this Dallon version. So let me convert these equations into that form, where just as a reminder, the box squared uh, means the Laplacian minus one over C squared d squared by dt squared. So it's just the operators that appear in our inhomogeneous wave equations. And using this box squared uh, notation, it just simplifies the equations a little bit. Um, so the nice thing is that in this representation, I have these two um, inhomogeneous wave equations uh, for the potentials, uh, which basically embody all of Maxwell's equations in terms of the potentials in the Lorentz gauge. And in here, we have a com on the right hand side, we have a component of the, we have a component of the current, J. We also have C times rho. And this is reminiscent, of course, of our four current. Let me just write the four current upstairs as a reminder. The four current J mu is equal to C rho in the time-like component, and then the usual three current J in the space-like component. And so we can actually write th these two equations in uh, a four vector form. If we assume that the four potential takes this form. So let's just write it down and see what it looks like. We have a very simple equation in our four vector language, which actually embodies all of Maxwell's equations. It tells us that box squared of the four potential is equal to minus mu naught times the four current. This is a four vector equation, meaning that it holds in all reference frames. And this is really embodying all of Maxwell's equations in this four vector form. Okay, but now we have to go back and re-examine the assumptions somewhat. First of all, if this expression is to be a four vector expression, then anything that uh, isn't manifestly a four vector, for example, the four potential here or the four current here, must be a Lorentz scalar. So mu naught, for example, must be a Lorentz scalar. Well, that is because it's just a number. It's uh, a universal constant of nature. But what about this? This is box squared. This is something involving these differential operators, and they involve space and time components. And of course, they will change individually uh, when you do a Lorentz transformation from one reference frame to the other. But miraculously, of course, this box squared is precisely this thing involving the four gradient. And so this is a Lorentz scalar. It is something that is the same in all reference frames. So if I were to do a Lorentz transformation of Maxwell's equations here, um, this box squared operator would not change when we go to different reference frames. So that's exactly what we want. This object is indeed a Lorentz scalar. That's one aspect. The other aspect is, I assumed in all of this that this a uh, mu object uh, 
which we called the four potential. I assumed that this was a proper four vector, a bona fide four vector. Now, we can actually see that it must be a four vector precisely because of this equation. In this equation, we have Maxwell's equations uh, reduced uh, into this one equation. And we know that the phenomena of electromagnetism described by Maxwell's equations is relativistically invariant. We know that when we change to different reference frames, the, um, the physical phenomena described by Maxwell's equations doesn't change. So the very fact that this expression uh, describes Maxwell's equations, and Maxwell's equations do hold in all reference frames, actually implies that this object that features in this equation is itself a four vector. Why? Because everything else in the equation is either a four vector or a Lorentz scalar. There's only one remaining hole in our argument, which is that the derivation of this expression, um, which is Maxwell's equations in four vector form, appears to require the specific form of Maxwell's equations in uh, described as inhomogeneous wave equations over here. And that required Lorentz gauge. So one more thing we need is to show that Lorentz gauge written here actually is something that holds in all reference frames. But of course, we see that it does. And that's because this uh, Lorentz gauge condition can actually be written itself as a four vector equation. It can be written in this way, which is manifestly Lorentz scalar. We can write it as the four gradient of the four potential. If we write this out, we simply recover this expression. And of course, that means that the concept of Lorentz gauge holds in all reference frames. If I apply Lorentz gauge in one reference frame, it will automatically apply in all other reference frames. So what that means is that these Maxwell's equations in Lorentz gauge can apply in all reference frames. And that's then everything we need. So we did several things here. First of all, we introduced the four potential, and we showed that indeed it is a four vector, given that we know Maxwell's equations are Lorentz invariant. And we actually derived Maxwell's equations in four vector form. So here it is again, this is the four potential, and we've argued that this is indeed a genuine four vector. And what does it mean to be a four vector? It means that one can do a Lorentz transformation. It means it transforms under the symmetry operations of the Poincaré group, which include the Lorentz transformations. And so what that means is that we can take, for example, the four potential in a primed reference frame uh, and relate it to the four potential in an unprimed reference frame, where those two reference frames are related by a constant relative velocity. So those are inertial reference frames. As an example, let's consider what happens to the uh, scalar potential phi in a primed reference frame. And it's equal to c times a0 in the primed reference frame. And so we can relate that now to the four potential in the unprimed reference frame. And with the explicit expression for our uh, Lorentz uh, transformation tensor lambda, uh, and using the Einstein summation convention over this repeated Greek index nu here, one upper and one lower, we obtain the following. Where in this expression, the v here is the relative velocity between the two reference frames. And so we see that the scalar potential in one reference frame actually gets mixed up with the scalar and the vector potentials in a different reference frame. Again, this is a highly non-trivial result. And it also tells you that in a dynamical world, where the uh, dynamics of the system could even be provided by a moving observer, we see that electricity and magnetism are not distinct things, but get mixed in together. So we have a beautiful description of the theory in terms of the potentials.
here generalizing to the four potential. But of course, the potentials are not observables. The observables that we are interested in are the electric and magnetic fields. So how do we incorporate these effects of special relativity and this formulation in terms of four vectors? How do we write that in terms of the fields themselves? Before we discuss that very important question, let's just pause a moment and consider this aside. Let's revisit the idea of the cross product. This might seem totally irrelevant to the current discussion, but actually we'll see that having a deeper mathematical understanding of the cross product will actually help us to understand what's going on in electrodynamics. And at heart, that's because the magnetic field is derived from the vector potential uh, through the curl of the vector potential. And the curl is, of course, nothing other than the cross product with the gradient operator. Consider, for example, angular momentum, which is defined as r cross p. r is the position vector, p is the momentum vector. And we'll ask ourselves, is the angular momentum L actually a vector? A question arises, where did this idea of the cross product being related to this funny determinant come from anyway? When you first heard about the cross product back in school, you probably thought, thought that's a bit weird and arbitrary, uh, but there it is, and then probably never gave it a second thought. Well, maybe now it's time to give it a second thought. It actually turns out that angular momentum has some funny properties that you might not have considered before, and that's actually related to the fact of this definition through the cross product. Let's consider the following example. Imagine we have a car that's driving towards us, as pictured here on the left. Because it's driving towards us, the wheels are rotating in a particular sense, and by the right-hand rule, we can associate with that rotation of the wheels a certain angular momentum, and that vector on this car here is this vector pointing to the right. So I'm just going to draw this vector on suggestively on this car. Whereas in, on the right-hand side, we have a car that's driving away from us. Now we get from the left-hand car to the right-hand car by doing a pi rotation. We rotate the car around the axis and uh, it's driving now in the opposite direction. The wheels are still rotating in such a way that the car is driving forwards, but now the angular momentum vectors are, of course, pointing in the opposite direction. And that just arises because the wheels are rotating in the opposite direction as far as the observer is concerned. So how does the angular momentum vector L, which I've drawn here as the red arrows, transform under the rotation? Well, we have this usual equation where this R here is a, a rotation matrix. And in this particular case, we're considering a pi rotation in the xy plane, let's say. And this transforms the angular momentum vector L um, from pointing to the right to L primed, where it's pointing to the left. What I've considered here is a particular symmetry operation, which is a simple rotation. It's a so-called proper rotation. Let's consider a different uh, transformation, an improper rotation, the so-called rotation reflection transformation. In this example of improper rotation, the so-called rotation reflection, on the left-hand side, I see a car driving away, which of course therefore has an angular momentum uh, vector for the wheels pointing to the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, I also have a car that's driving away, but it's the mirror image of that car. So we see, for example, this pattern on the car and these lights on the top. These are the mirror image of each other. But the car is still driving away, so the re wheels are still rotating in the same sense, and therefore the angular momentum vector is still pointing to the left. So even though we do a reflection of the image of the car itself, the angular momentum vector does not get reflected. And so we get a transformation equation like this, where L primed is minus R of L, 
where here I'm using a different transformation matrix, R tilde, which uh, encapsulates this improper rotation. And the defining feature actually of an improper rotation is one where the determinant of the transformation matrix is equal to minus one. So the fact that the magnitude is either plus or minus one means that there's no scaling and we're just doing rotations and reflections. But if it's minus one of the determinant, then it means that we're doing a reflection. Whereas the determinant of a proper rotation is equal to plus one. And therefore we can combine these two uh, expressions into the following which holds for any kind of transformation. Um, let's consider a general transformation matrix M. And to get the correct uh, angular momentum, uh, we need not only to transform the vector M times L, but we also need to multiply by the determinant of that matrix. And this is what defines a so-called pseudo vector. And so what we have in general is that a true vector, a so-called polar vector, is one that has the usual transformation property that we'd expect. Whereas pseudo vectors or axial vectors carry with them this additional minus sign for improper rotations, which is encoded in the determinant of the transformation matrix M. So these are the two different kinds of vectors that we might not have uh, considered before. The fact that the angular momentum is a pseudo vector can be traced back to the definition in terms of the cross product R cross P. And in fact, it's totally general result that any uh, vector that is arising from the cross product is actually a pseudo vector. These differences between vectors and pseudo vectors and the symmetry properties of pseudo vectors can be understood in terms of a more rigorous and mathematical description of the cross product. So let's just uh, sketch that mathematical structure now. Let's introduce a tensor object with two indices, i and j, and i and j are elements of um, x, y, and z. They're components. And on the right hand side of this definition, uh, we see the position vector or components of the position vector Ri or Rj and components of the momentum vector Pi and Pj. And this object is uh, defined to be anti-symmetric, which means that Lij by definition is minus Lji. And that also tells us right away, of course, that L i i for any i x y and z is equal to zero. So we have a three-dimensional vector for the position r and we have a three-dimensional vector for the momentum p. And when we form the product of r and p there are many different things that we can do and one of them is simply to consider all of the uh, the different combinations of r i and p j but what we're doing here is considering a specific way of doing that, which is anti-symmetric. So this combination here is uh, anti-symmetrizing the result. And we're left over with a three by three tensor or a matrix basically. But because it's anti-symmetric and because of these properties, we actually only have three independent entries to that matrix. Expressing this tensor L as a three by three matrix, we have something that looks like this uh, in the component form. We only have three independent elements, which are this one, this one, and this one, because these other elements are just minus those things and the diagonal are equal to zero because it's anti-symmetric. Now, one of the amazing things is that the components of this matrix is three independent components. Those components actually transform like components of a regular vector. What I mean is that they transform under rotations and translations of our coordinate system. In particular, it can be shown that the 1, 2 element of this matrix transforms like the z component of a vector.
Let's call that LZ. The 1, 3 component of the matrix transforms rather strangely, like minus the y component of a standard vector. And the 2, 3 component transforms like the x component of a standard vector. And of course, we know that the diagonal entries are equal to 0. And by the anti-symmetry property, this must be minus LZ, this must be plus LY, and this term must be minus LX. So here, I'm just writing these components out in this particular way. Um, I'm just labeling those things as LX, LY, and LZ, just because they transform like the X, Y, and Z components of a vector. And so what we do is we just use take those three components and we just assemble them into a vector that we call L. which has components Lx, Ly, and Lz. But this is not a true vector. We just put them into, a, there are just three components, we just put them into this three component vector form because they transform like components of vector. However, this thing is in truth a pseudo vector and we were able to show that a moment ago just pictorially by looking at this example of the cars um, and the rotations and the reflections of these things. So this thing that I've denoted here as L is not actually a vector, it's really a pseudo vector. But this, when we write down the cross product um, of two vectors and we write it down Lx, Ly and Lz in this way, really they're just the independent entries of this L tensor matrix. And one final thing, if Lx here is given by this combination of the components of the R and P vectors, if minus Ly is given by this combination, and if Lz is given by this combination, and if we assemble Lx, Ly, and Lz into a vector, that whole thing can be expressed in a very concise way as the determinant. which is the thing that we know and love. And that's just like a shorthand simplified way of getting the right answer. But it should be understood that really what we're doing here is forming this uh, tensor object and then just looking at the three components, uh, the three independent components of this L tensor and just shoving them into a vector form. But really, it's a pseudo vector. So you might be wondering why on earth we're talking about this. <clears throat> the reason is that in electromagnetism, we have a definition of the magnetic field in terms of the cross product of the gradient operator with the vector potential A. So from this, we might conclude that the magnetic field is not actually a vector field, but a pseudo vector field. Maybe it would be better to introduce something I will call Bij, which would follow as uh, d by dRi of the component Aj of uh, the vector potential minus d by dR j of the component ai of the vector potential. I could then write out a 3 by 3 matrix, let's say. It's really a, a tensor, but let's just write it in matrix form and not be too pedantic about it. And in, in exactly the same way as in our previous uh, work on the uh, definition of the angular momentum, we'd see that this could be written in terms of components of this form. And it is those components that we usually assemble into this thing called B.
which is a vector. Or we now should probably recognize this as a pseudo vector. As I now want to show you, it turns out that the generalization of this concept to four-dimensional space-time, rather than just the three dimensions that we have here, gives rise to something called the electromagnetic field tensor, which involves both the magnetic uh, and the electric fields, not just B X, Y, and Z, but E X, E Y, and E Z. And it is this total thing, this electromagnetic field tensor, which is the fundamental object which fe features in the theory of electrodynamics. And of course, if we were to have a four by four matrix or a four by four tensor, and it is anti-symmetric tensor, then we know the four diagonal elements will be equal to zero, and the off diagonal elements will be related by the anti-symmetry property. And that tells us that we have six independent entries in our four by four matrix. And magically, those six entries are the three components of the magnetic field and the three components of the electric field. So let's see how all this works. The central object that we're interested in in electromagnetism uh, when we're considering the uh, relativistic formulation is a similar kind of object. It's called the electromagnetic field tensor and it's denoted F mu nu. So it has two indices mu and nu, they're Greek indices, so they run over their four um, components of space-time. And it's defined in a similar kind of way to the discussion we had a moment ago, except instead of having uh, different combinations of three vectors, we now have different combinations of four vectors. We have the four gradient and the four potential, and is an anti-symmetric tensor. And so we just include these things with the indices the other way around, and this guarantees the anti-symmetry property. But otherwise, you see that it's kind of pretty similar to the definition of uh, the magnetic field in terms of the curl of the uh, vector potential. So let's have a look at this interesting object uh, and discuss some of the properties of it. The first important property I want to discuss is the fact that this electromagnetic field tensor, as so defined, is gauge invariant. It means that I can change the gauge for the uh, electromagnetic potentials, the scalar potential and the vector potential, um, and this object, f mu nu, will not change. That means that this electromagnetic field tensor is an observable because it does not depend on the gauge choice. And we'll see, actually, that it's related to the electric and magnetic fields. So first of all, let's establish this fact that this object is gauge invariant. First, let's just remind ourselves that the four gradient written here, d mu, is 1 upon c d by dt um, in the time-like component, and then the usual gradient operator for dx, dy, dz in the space-like components whilst the covariant for potential is equal to minus the scalar potential over C in the time-like component, and then the usual x, y, and z components of the vector potential in the space-like components of this four vector. So with these definitions in mind, let's prove that the electromagnetic field tensor is gauge invariant. To do that, we'll perform a gauge transformation of our potentials. Let's consider uh, a new vector potential, which is related to the old vector potential through the gradient of some scalar field psi and some new scalar potential related to the old scalar potential with minus d by dt of psi being the uh, the extra factor. So we're going to just use these definitions to transform the electromagnetic field tensor. So this is what we have, where here 
we have the definition of the gauge transformed for potential, which can also be expressed directly in terms of the old for potential. And indeed, this second term here, which accounts for the gauge transformation, can actually be written in terms of our four gradient. So what happens when we substitute in this uh, gauge transformation of the four potential into our definition of the electromagnetic field tensor? Well then, obviously, we obtain the following. We get the contributions from the old four potentials, and then we get an extra term. And these two terms can be considered separately, the two terms in these brackets. This one is clearly the definition of our um, electromagnetic field tensor in the old system before we did the gauge transformation. And this term is equal to zero. And that's because in here, we have these second mixed derivatives of the scalar field psi. We have things like uh, d squared psi by d uh, x mu uh, d x nu. And in this second term, which enters with the minus sign, um, we have the same kind of things, uh, but the order of the derivatives is uh, opposite. So as long as we have smooth differentiable functions uh, for our scalar field psi, then of course, those second mixed derivatives are equal, and this term will exactly cancel. So what we've managed to prove explicitly is under our gauge transformation, the electromagnetic field tensor is invariant. That means that we can change our gauge from whatever gauge to whatever we like, and the electromagnetic field tensor will be unchanged, thereby telling us that the electromagnetic field tensor is an observable quantity that doesn't depend on the gauge. So if it's an observable, what observable is it? So here we have the electromagnetic field tensor written out again. Um, of course, what we have in this expression is time and space derivatives of the potentials. And we know that the electric and magnetic fields are actually related to time and space derivatives of the potentials through these uh, important equations. And so what we can do is just go through element by element in the electromagnetic field tensor and compute these derivatives and then see what we get in terms of the electric and magnetic fields. And when you do that, I won't go through all of the steps because that's a bit laborious, you can try that for yourself, but when you do that you get the following result. So this might look a little bit complicated, um, but it actually has an understandable structure. So if you imagine uh, dividing this into blocks containing a magnetic field and electric field, then we see this lower 3x3 three three block is exactly what we had previously for uh, the magnetic field uh, when we were discussing it in terms of being a pseudo vector. So here, this is the generalization of that treatment, except now expanded to four-dimensional space-time. And using this definition of the four gradient and the four potential, this is all just rolled up into one consistent picture. So the real thing that we're dealing with in electromagnetism uh, is this electromagnetic field tensor. So we see that electricity and magnetism are all just dimensions of the same thing. They were all just different, uh, different dimensions of this single object. And because this is uh, this tensor here is related to four vectors, 
we can, of course, change our reference frame by doing a Lorentz transformation of those four vectors, and we will see the electric and magnetic fields will get all scrambled up together. So even just changing our inertial frame of reference will change our perspective of what it means to have electric and magnetic fields. Those things will get mixed up together. And the precise way in which they do that is contained within the mathematical structure depicted here. So let me just emphasize that this is an anti-symmetric tensor. And I'll also mention that typically, um, if we're going to depict it in this kind of matrix form here, then the first index is referring to the rows and the second index to the columns. So this is not a symmetric matrix, it's an anti-symmetric matrix. The difference between swapping the rows and columns, of course, is just a minus sign, so it's not that important in the end. So let's have a look now at a Lorentz transformation of the electromagnetic field tensor. This is important because if I change my reference frame using the Lorentz transformation, then I want to be able to say what happens to the electric and magnetic fields, and that will be contained in the electromagnetic field tensor. So because um, the electromagnetic field tensor consists of four vectors, if we want to find out the Lorentz transformed electromagnetic field tensor, we can just consider it from the definition in terms of four vectors and transform each of those individually. What I mean from that concretely is the following. Let's say I want to know a particular component of the electromagnetic field tensor in the primed reference frame. I just use the definition of the field tensor in terms of the four vectors. The four vectors in question, of course, being the four gradient and the four potential arranged in this anti-symmetric way. And each of those things have primes. And now we just use the usual Lorentz transformation to convert uh, these four vectors in the primed reference frame to the unprimed reference frame. And then we'll get the following. Where, as usual here, the Einstein summation convention over the repeated Greek index sigma, one upper, one lower, lambda, lambda, and sigma is implied. We can tidy the algebra up a bit here, and we get this. Just by factorizing out those uh, Lorentz transformation tensors there. And then we can recognize, of course, that this object in the brackets here is nothing other than the electromagnetic field tensor in the unprimed frame. And so finally, we have the transformation expression for the field tensor. And so we have this very important equation. Note also on the right-hand side, we have a double summation over lambda and also over sigma. So when we do a normal uh, Lorentz transformation of a four vector, we have one factor of the uh, Lorentz transformation uh, tensor there. When we have uh, the transformation of a tensor itself, we have to have uh, as many factors of the Lorentz transformation uh, tensor as we have indices. So in this case, the electromagnetic field tensor has two indices, mu and nu, so we have two factors of this thing. And as with the Lorentz transformation of a simple four vector, we can actually view this uh, as a matrix product. So we imagine that the electromagnetic field tensor is a four by four matrix, and these Lorentz transformation uh, tensors are four by four matrices. And then we'd get something like this, where here the, all of these objects are matrices, and in particular, we have the F uh, electromagnetic field tensor in the primed frame on the left-hand side, uh, whereas we have the electromagnetic field tensor F in the unprimed frame on the right-hand side. But just taking into account the proper summation over these various indices, the matrix product we form is actually lambda F lambda. So we've got to get the order of the matrix products right. So if we write it all out, we get something like this. So this is a triple matrix product. We see here on the left-hand side of the equation the field tensor in the prime frame. Sandwiched between the two lambda matrices here is the field tensor in the unprimed frame. 
And uh, this is the full expression. If you were to do this full matrix product, you would uh, find a relation between all of the elements of F primed to all of the elements of F. Of course, you don't have to do it as a big matrix product. You can just use this expression directly to find any given particular element you're interested in. So let's do an example of that. So as an example, let's have a look at the Y component of the magnetic field in the primed frame. How does that relate to the electric and magnetic fields in the unprimed frame? The primed and unprimed frames are, of course, just related uh, by a relative velocity along the X direction, which we'll call V. So um, what we find is that this By primed, of course, that is equal to the 3, 1 element of the electromagnetic field tensor in the primed frame. Remember that the first index in the field tensor is the row of this matrix, and the second index is the column. So if you uh, remember the expression for the field tensor, then uh, the 3, 1 element is indeed uh, the y component of the magnetic field. And uh, using the Einstein summation convention and just going through all of that, we can show that this is equal to gamma of F31 plus beta gamma of F30. And they're the only finite terms. So I'll leave it to you to, to go through the matrix product of those things. And if we now uh, convert or translate back the meaning of F31 and F30, we'll find that this is actually equal to gamma lots of By plus V upon C squared of EZ. So of course this is rather interesting. What it tells us is that the magnetic field uh, along the y direction in the primed frame is related to the magnetic field along the y direction in the unprimed frame, plus there's a piece coming from the uh, electric field as well. So this is indeed quite interesting. Note also that if our velocities v were very small compared to the speed of light, then this would be a very small term that we wouldn't maybe notice. Also, the Lorentz factor gamma would be approaching 1. So in the non-relativistic limit, of uh, the velocity much less than the speed of light. Note here that the velocity is, in particular, the uh, relative velocity between the reference frames. Nothing. We're not talking about anything moving specifically at this frame, uh, this uh, speed, other than the observer. In the non-relativistic limit, we see that By is approximately equal uh, to By in the primed reference frame. But uh, when we're moving quickly and we take into account the effects of special relativity, we see that the electric and magnetic fields get scrambled up um, when we change reference frame according to this expression. Let's have a look at the electric field. Let's have a look at the electric field along the x direction in the primed reference frame. Looking at our electromagnetic field tensor, that's equal to C times the F10 uh, component of the field tensor in the primed frame. And if we go through the calculation again, and we expand out that uh, triple matrix product, and we tidy up a bit of algebra, we find this is equal to C times F10 in the unprimed frame, which is, of course, just the electric field along the x direction. So this is, again, somewhat interesting. It tells us that if we have a relative velocity between our two inertial reference frames along the x direction, then the electric field along the x direction is not changed. So what else can we learn from this transformation? So let's take a look at the electric field along the z direction in the primed frame, which is just C lots of F three zero in the primed frame. So we're looking at the electric field along the z direction 
in a reference frame that's moving relative to ours um, with a relative velocity along the x direction. So what does the Lorentz transformation give us for this? Well, we get one piece that comes from basically the electric field along the z direction in the unprimed frame, and then one piece that, interestingly, comes from the y component of the magnetic field in the unprimed frame. And there's an overall factor of gamma in here, which is the Lorentz factor. So this is also a rather interesting result, and we're going to explore some of the consequences of this now. Let's consider a charged particle Q moving along the x-axis with a velocity v, subject to a uniform magnetic field that's acting along the y direction. And let's assume here that there's no electric field present. What is the force on the particle? Well, we use the Lorentz force law that tells us the force on the particle is equal to the charge of the particle times the electric field, but there's no electric field here, plus the velocity of the particle cross the magnetic field. So this is um, a cross product between V and B here, and the magnetic field is only acting along the Y direction. And what this tells you is that the force only acts along the Z direction. So the force here is uh, equal to a force along Z times the unit vector along Z. And specifically, the force along Z is Q times V times the magnetic field along the y direction, by. Let's consider now changing the reference frame and seeing what happens to the force. In particular, let's choose a reference frame which is co-moving with the particle. So our reference frame will jog along with the particle along the x-axis at velocity v. So in our reference frame, the particle is not moving. So the force in the primed reference frame is the uh, Q, the charge on the particle, which is conserved, that's the same, times the electric field. But here the velocity is now equal to zero in the primed reference frame. And so that's it. We just have that the force in the primed reference frame must be the charge on the particle times the electric field in the primed reference frame. Now, if the principle of relativity is to hold that the physics is the same in different reference frames, then we have a bit of a puzzle because in the unprimed frame, uh, unprimed frame we have a force acting along the z direction, which has uh, this magnitude. And in the primed reference frame, uh, we have Q times the electric field. And there's no electric field in the original system. But of course, now we understand what's going on because uh, if we were to work out the electric field um, in the primed reference frame, we would see it's actually related, as we see from this expression, to the magnetic field in the unprimed frame. And in particular, if you were to work out all the components of the electric field, you would find that it was only the electric field along the z direction um, that was finite due to the magnetic field acting in the original frame uh, the unprimed frame along the y direction. And there's no electric field acting in the original unprimed system. And so we can actually write down what the force is because we know what the uh, electric field in the primed frame is. And the answer is it's gamma V, well, we still have the charge Q in here, sorry, times By. And so this is uh, very interesting because it tells us that the force in the unprimed frame is almost exactly the same as the force in the primed frame, but the mechanism is very, very different. In the unprimed frame, it's due to the magnetic part of the Lorentz force, whereas in the primed frame, it's due to the electric part of the Lorentz force. But the magnitude, QVBY, QVBY, is exactly the same in, the, in both cases, except for this thorny... Um, extra factor of the Lorentz factor here. So this requires a little bit of further explanation. 
In the non-relativistic limit, these forces would be exactly the same because the Lorentz factor would be close to one. And of course, that's what we observe in everyday life. We would observe that if I jog along with a particle, of course, we see the same force. It doesn't matter that I'm moving along, the particle sees the same force. Um, so in the non-relativistic limit that we're used to, this makes eminent good sense. However, if things are moving very quickly, if the relative velocity um, between the two reference frames is very large, uh, or if the uh, speed of the particle itself, v, is very large, then we seem to run into a problem because the two forces are not the same, and we would expect from the principle of relativity that um, the physics of the, the, of the particle should be the same in two inertial reference frames, but these forces don't appear to be the same. The resolution here is just to go back to our classical mechanics and remember that, of course, it is the four force that should be invariant, is the four force that is, uh, should be the relativistic quantity we consider, and these are just the regular three forces. So the solution to the quandary is to basically to say, okay, so let's, what would happen to this particle? It feels a force, it therefore accelerates according to Newton's second law, and we'd see a certain trajectory. It's the trajectory, really, that is the thing that is the observable. It's what happens to the particle as a consequence of the force that we observe. And in relativity, if we go to a different reference frame, then apparently we have a slightly different force, but the trajectory will remain exactly the same. And the reason for that is that the force, of course, is really, the uh, by Newton's second law, the rate of change of the momentum, and it's the momentum, the change in the momentum that we actually see in the trajectory. But the rate of change of momentum depends on, of course, taking a time derivative. And we have time dilation as we go from one reference frame to the other. So there's a little bit of a subtlety here, it turns out, when calculating the trajectory in the two uh, reference frames. Uh, but it, when you work through it, it turns out the trajectory is identical to to uh, these two different forces um, in the primed and unprimed reference frame. Um, as I said, it's easiest to see in the non-relativistic limit, where even in that case, uh, you would see that the forces are basically the same, uh, even though the mechanism for the forces is very different. OK, so let's now uh, take a step back and revisit Maxwell's equations, uh, but we'll do it now in terms of the four vector formulation. And we already saw how Maxwell's equations could be written in four vector form in terms of the potentials, but now let's see how it looks in terms of the electromagnetic fields themselves, which are of course contained in this electromagnetic field tensor F. So the result is that we can write Maxwell's equations in this nice four vector form. And this equation being a four vector equation, of course, is something that applies in all reference frames. We can do a Lorentz transformation of the individual uh, four vectors that feature in this expression. And we've just explored how we can do a Lorentz transformation of the electromagnetic field tensor. So this is basically Maxwell's equations. Actually, it contains all of the information in Maxwell's equations when coupled with the Bianchi identity, which we considered uh, in one of the assignments. So the first thing to do, of course, is to verify that this equation that I've pulled out of the hat here is, in fact, uh, equivalent to Maxwell's equations in the four potential formulation that we derived uh, rigorously uh, earlier on in this lecture. So what we'll do is we'll just plug into this left-hand side here the definition of the electromagnetic field tensor, and we obtain the following in terms of the four potential A nu. And we can play the usual trick of reordering these uh, derivatives. Uh, 
So let's just uh, unpack this a little bit and write it in the following way. So in the second of these terms here, we see a contraction um, in the usual way of this gradient operator. And this, of course, gives us the Dalenbergian uh, box squared. What about this term? Well, this is actually the Lorentz gauge condition. So in the Lorentz gauge, this is equal to zero. And previously, we worked out uh, Maxwell's equations in terms of the four potential in the Lorentz gauge. So in the Lorentz gauge, which we'll stick to for now, of course, uh, then this first term is equal to zero. So in the end, uh, the left-hand side is just equal to minus box squared of A. And so we can summarize by writing box squared of A mu is equal to minus mu naught of the four uh, current j mu. And this is exactly what we had before in terms of the potentials. So this is indeed exactly equivalent to our previous result. But now we're writing Maxwell's equations in terms of the electromagnetic field tensor, which might be nicer because this is directly now in terms of the electric and magnetic fields, which in the end are the things that we want. So these equations really describing um, the physics contained in Maxwell's equations, actually I should be more specific, the information contained in this four vector equation is the information that's contained in Gauss's law and the Maxwell Ampere law. I mentioned earlier somewhat obliquely that uh, Maxwell's equations uh, were fully described by this four vector equation plus the Bianchi identity. So let me just remind you of the Bianchi identity. Actually, it turns out the Bianchi identity contains the information in the other two of Maxwell's equations. So the Bianchi identity is as follows. It's these various derivatives of the uh, electromagnetic field tensor, which involve these cyclic permutations. And the Bianchi identity says that this object is equal to zero. This is very easy to prove. You can just go through it uh, element by element and show that because the second mixed derivatives are equal for these smooth, uh, well-behaved functions, um, that this object uh, goes to zero. So that's easily proved by just putting in this definition of the electromagnetic field tensor. So this Bianchi identity, just as an aside, uh, tells us about the information contained in the other two of Maxwell's equations, the uh, the one that the divergence of the magnetic field is equal to zero and uh, Faraday's law. One final thing I want to show you with regards to the electromagnetic field tensor is what happens if we contract the indices. What I mean specifically is let's consider this inner product this is a Lorentz scalar object because we have the contraction of the, uh, of the indices, we have the Einstein summation convention over this repeated index mu and over the repeated index nu. So we sum over both of those things and using the same logic as before, this must be something that is invariant depend no matter what our reference frame. So if we change our reference frame, we still have the same value of this object. So this is a Lorentz scalar, it's a relativistic invariant. If you work through the maths of this and just uh, work out 
all of those components summed over, what do we get? I leave this for you to confirm. You get b squared minus 1 upon c squared of the electric field strength squared. So this object is the same in all reference frames. It's a Lorentz scalar. And we know that because it was obtained by this usual process of contracting these indices here. So this is rather interesting because it tells us that the, uh, the magnetic field strength squared minus 1 upon c squared, the electric field strength squared, is something that doesn't depend on our reference frame. And actually, this reminds us a little bit of the expression for the energy density in the fields. It's not quite the same, but it's related. So this we call U sub EM for electromagnetic internal energy. And this was one half of epsilon naught E squared plus one upon mu naught of B squared. And there is obviously some kind of connection between these two expressions, uh, which you can see a little better if I multiply this expression by mu naught. And then remember that epsilon naught mu naught is one upon C squared. And now you can see that these expressions are almost exactly the same, except that there's a plus sign in the internal energy, whereas this is a minus sign. So we'll return to this in a moment when discussing the Lagrangian for electromagnetism. But for now, suffice to say that when we contract uh, the electromagnetic field tensor with itself, we get something uh, by construction that is a Lorentz scalar. It's the same in all reference frames. And it's the difference between the electric and magnetic fields. This internal energy is not that object because it differs with uh, from the minus sign to the plus sign. So we can infer that this actually does change with our reference frame. As we go from one reference frame to the other, it looks like the energy stored in the fields will change. And that's correct. The energy is not itself a Lorentz scalar. It's a component of a four vector that changes uh, with reference frame. So what is the four vector for which the energy is a component? Well, of course, that's the uh, four momentum that we discussed in the context of classical mechanics and relativity. For now, let's simply leave it at the, the fact that the energy stored in the electromagnetic fields is frame dependent, but that this object is frame independent. And they only differ from each other by this minus sign. The last topic that I want to address in this lecture, and indeed this will be the last topic in the entire course, is a Lagrangian field theory for electromagnetism. We talked about many things in this course, uh, Maxwell's equations and latterly the reformulation of this in terms of uh, relativistic four vectors. We talked about Lorentz invariance. We talked about gauge invariance. We talked about ideas of causality and locality. So I want to draw this all together finally in this final topic and discuss a Lagrangian formulation of this problem. And we'll write down a Lagrangian for electrodynamics. This Lagrangian can then be used with the principle of least action to find the equations of motion for the system. They tell us how the fields interact with each other and how they interact uh, with uh, charged particles and current we'll find that when we plug in our electromagnetic Lagrangian into the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion, we will actually generate Maxwell's equations. But before we do that, I want to discuss the general principles for constructing a field theory. These kind of principles that I will talk about really apply to any kind of theory within physics. All known theories that we have satisfy these principles,
And so these are really like, like guiding lights for us to construct our field theory um, in terms of the Lagrangian for electromagnetism. In the end, when we write down our Lagrangian, we'll be able to check that it's correct by plugging it in to the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion and generating back Maxwell's equations. That's the ultimate check uh, here, because we believe that Maxwell's equations are correct and describe nature. So what are these principles? Well, there's three important principles that I want to talk about. They are locality, Lorentz invariance, and gauge invariance. So let's take each of those uh, one by one. So the first of these is the important concept of locality, which Einstein encapsulated very nicely when he said there should be no spooky action at a distance. So the idea of locality is that dynamical information about how a system evolves does not travel through space instantaneously. There is a minimum time it takes for the information to travel from a distant point to us, and that minimum time depends on the distance between us and that phenomena. That minimum time is related to the distance and, of course, the speed, and that minimum time is simply uh, delta x over c. That's the minimum possible time because the maximum possible speed is the speed of light. So in, in an infinitesimal time step dt, only information about the neighbouring points dx can possibly affect the physics. And this is basically connected to the idea of causality. If we have uh, a, a causal relationship between things, then we require that the information cannot just travel instantaneously. So this concept of locality implies that the equations governing the dynamics of a system are differential equations. The dynamical evolution at a certain point in space depends on what's going on at that point and in the neighbouring points, uh, dx, away from that point, in a time period, dt. So the equations, therefore, are local equations that apply point-wise in space, and these are differential equations involving the values of the fields at those points, and the gradients of the fields at those points, and the rates of change of the fields at that point. So these are local equations, and they're differential equations. In the end, uh, this results in our formulation in terms of the action principle, and the principle of least action, of course, yields the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion for the dynamics of the system in terms of a Lagrangian, and those equations are differential equations. The second very important and very general principle is that of Lorentz invariance. The equations governing the dynamics of a system should not depend on the inertial reference frame of the observer, and this is the principle of relativity. We have the same physics in all inertial reference frames. So when we switch to a different reference frame, the equation, equations governing our system and the physics of our system should not change. And we know how to change the inertial reference frame. It's by doing a Lorentz transformation. And therefore, the equations governing the dynamics of our system should be Lorentz invariant. They should be Lorentz scalar quantities which do not depend on the reference frame. If it were otherwise, then different observers would calculate different physics for the same situation, and of course that violates the principle of relativity. This means that in terms of our Lagrangian, we must use only Lorentz scalars. These should be obtained by suitable contraction of the indices of various four vectors and tensors and so on. For example, our Lagrangian should only contain terms like this or terms like this, because we know that these are Lorentz scalars. And on the last slide, we also looked at contraction of indices for tensor objects such as this. So all of these things are Lorentz scalars. And these are things that don't depend on the reference frame. So are good candidates for things from which we can construct our electromagnetic Lagrangian. So I'm not saying that any of these things in particular uh, have to feature, but the kinds of things that go into our electromagnetic Lagrangian can only be these kinds of objects.
Actually, as we'll see, this kind of thing here does feature. That's coming up. So if the Lagrangian is a Lorentz scalar, what that means is that when we plug it into the principle of least action, then all observers in different inertial reference frames will calculate the same minimum action for the same physical situation, and that will have the same physics. And therefore, using the principle of least action with a Lorentz invariant uh, Lagrangian tells us automatically that the principle of relativity will be respected. The final guiding principle that I want to talk about is gauge invariance. This is a little bit more of a subtlety. So the gauge symmetry of the underlying fundamental potentials or fields involved in the theory, which for electromagnetism are the, are the scalar and vector potentials, so these fundamental potentials have a certain local internal symmetry, which we call a gauge symmetry. And the fact of this symmetry implies that our Lagrangian must be gauge invariant. In particular, we know that physical properties, observables, cannot depend on the gauge choice. And so the Lagrangian is basically a physical observable because through it, we determine our equations of motion. So the Lagrangian itself must be uh, gauge invariant. That will then guarantee that the equations of motion are gauge invariant. They don't depend on our gauge choice. And this therefore respects this local gauge symmetry of the fundamental potentials. So the idea is that there's a wider or broader kind of symmetry in these problems. They are not simply uh, global uh, symmetries where we can rotate or translate our coordinate system. Uh, and of course, we talked about Lorentz symmetry as well, doing Lorentz boosts along different directions. There's actually an even bigger symmetry which is a local symmetry, an internal symmetry between the components of the potentials, which can be applied from point to point in space and also changing in time. And this wider symmetry is the gauge symmetry. It turns out that all known theories are gauge theories in physics. They are ones that have these uh, hidden local symmetries. And we want to incorporate that into our definition of the theory and our formulation of the Lagrangian, we insist that it must be, that the Lagrangian itself must be gauge invariant. And again, that restricts the kind of things that can appear in our Lagrangian. So to satisfy these three principles of locality, Lorentz invariance, and gauge invariance, we actually have quite a few restrictions on the kind of things we can write down. So what is the Lagrangian of classical electrodynamics? Well, it starts with the action principle. Let's write down the action, the classical action. The action, denoted S, is equal to the integral of the Lagrangian dt. But here we're going to be talking about field theories. Electrodynamics is, of course, a field theory, which is a continuum theory. It exists everywhere in space. So we're not just interested in the total Lagrangian. It makes more sense to discuss the Lagrange density, which is denoted with this curly L, where we integrate over space and also uh, time here. So this uh, curly L here is the Lagrange density, or Lagrangian density, if you like. And we see that this is an integral over the whole of space-time. And we can denote that in a slightly more compact notation by writing the, uh, the integral over d to the 4x. And this is supposed to mean the four components of our four-dimensional space-time. Now we use one of the most powerful concepts in all of physics, the principle of least action. It tells us that the correct classical physics is obtained when the action is minimized. And this condition of the action being minimized for the correct classical physics can be written mathematically simply as ds equals zero 
so it's a, a stationary point. Of course, you could also have a, a maximum action that satisfied this, uh, but in most situations th there is no maximum action. The action just can continue to increase and increase and increase as you get further away from the true physics. Uh, but the true physics will be the minimum in the action, which is unique. So some lengthy algebra is then required uh, to convert this ds equals zero condition into the equations of motion for the system in terms of the Lagrangian itself. That is straightforward, but a bit laborious. Uh, we did that already in the classical mechanics and relativity module. However, um, it's a little bit more complicated when you have a full field theory with this integral here over the different uh, spatial dimensions as well as time. And also when you have different fields and different components of the fields. So from the relativistic Lagrangian density and this condition, we obtain the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion when we do that. So let me just write down that expression in terms of the fundamental potentials that feature in the theory of electrodynamics. And this is what we obtain. It's straightforward, um, but a little laborious, so I won't prove this. It's in all of the, the textbooks. And I've written this uh, specifically in the index notation of four vectors, where in here we see x mu, of course, being the usual four vector for the event. The curly L is the Lagrangian density. And then also in here we have the four potential A nu. So I'll just put here as a reminder that x mu the event is C T and the position R, whereas the four potential A mu is uh, the scalar potential phi upon C and the vector potential. For future reference, we'll also just write down the four current, which is, of course, C rho, the charge density, and J, the usual three current density. And as usual in this expression, the Einstein summation convention is assumed. So our general philosophy is that we're going to come up with some kind of Lagrangian, that when we plug into this equation, we generate as our equations of motion, Maxwell's equations. Of course, the Maxwell's equations that we come up with uh, will be something in relativistic four vector form, and we've just worked that out, and the equation that we're seeking, it, it, when all said and done, is going to be this one. This is Maxwell's equations written in terms of the electromagnetic field tensor and the four current J. But of course, when we have the Lagrangian, we can do far more with it. So this will give us uh, greater power to do uh, problems in classical physics uh, in terms of electrodynamics. So what is the Lagrangian that we seek? Well, first of all, we're going to decompose it into three pieces. The first piece is the Lagrangian for the free sources. And by sources here, I mean charged particles or currents. So these are the free particles and currents, not in any potential, not in any fields, just isolated. And of course, that's basically just the kinetic energy of the sources. Secondly, we have the Lagrange density for the fields themselves, again, in isolation, without any sources present, just the Lagrangian for the fields in isolation. And finally, we have an important term, which is, of course, the coupling between the, the sources and the fields. So the Lagrange density here will describe the coupling between the charge density and the current density and the electric and magnetic fields. So we have the two things in isolation and the coupling between them. So if we were to consider a single charged particle Q of some mass M moving with some velocity V, then of course we know what Lagrangian for that system is for the free particle, which just contains the kinetic energy, and we know that Lagrangian is minus mc squared uh, multiplied by the square root 
of 1 minus v squared over c squared. This is the relativistic Lagrangian for a free particle. And of course, we can generalize that to an arbitrary distribution of moving uh, particles or currents. And I actually don't want to say anything more about the Lagrangian for the sources at this point. Uh, they are just the usual relativistic Lagrangians for those particles. What I want to focus on is the Lagrangian for the fields and the coupling. Okay, so let's now focus on the Lagrange density for the fields. Well, in the previous slides, I was discussing how we are guided by certain principles in constructing our Lagrangian. In particular, our Lagrangian should be uh, something that is Lorentz invariant and gauge invariant, and that actually restricts the kind of things we can write down. Let me write down one such object, and then uh, I'll show you why this is the right thing to write down. Imagine that our Lagrange density is given by the contraction of the electromagnetic field tensor with itself. This has the two nice properties that we're looking for. It's Lorentz invariant and it's gauge invariant. And we showed that uh, in the earlier part of this lecture. It's Lorentz invariant because we're doing the contraction of these tensors using the usual um, Einstein uh, summation over the repeated index mu here and the repeated index nu. And by construction, this gives something, as we proved, that is Lorentz invariant. But also, this object is gauge invariant, and we also proved that. So this object has the right properties that we're looking for. But in fact, we can also put in here any uh, constant, uh, let's call it uh, alpha, we can put any constant there, and that Lagrangian, of course, would still be Lorentz invariant and gauge invariant. Um, so it's, we, we have something that's a plausible Lagrangian, but uh, we've not defined yet what this, uh, what this constant alpha is. And we can express this uh, Lagrange density in terms of the electric and magnetic fields, and this is what we obtained. Uh, we found this in the previous part of this lecture. Good. Now, one of the motivating reasons for using this, uh, this object in our Lagrangian, apart from it having the nice properties of Lorentz and gauge invariance, is uh, the relation between the Lagrangian, the Hamiltonian, and the energy. And so if we take this Lagrangian as written, let's perform a Legendre transformation to convert from the Lagrange density to the Hamiltonian density. Uh, I won't go through this, it's a little bit uh, technical, uh, something you can try for yourselves if you want. But converting from this Lagrangian, we obtain uh, the following Hamiltonian. Um, where we have this overall minus sign here, uh, but basically it's the sum of those two terms rather than in the Lagrangian where we have the difference of those two terms. And this might, of course, uh, remind you or be reminiscent in, uh, in, in usual classical mechanics when the Lagrangian is uh, the kinetic energy minus the potential energy and the Hamiltonian is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So, um, so we have something that uh, looks somewhat familiar here especially more so because in the previous part of this lecture course, we actually worked out what the energy density of the fields was, and we had this result. And from this expression, you can see that this, is, this energy density of the electric and magnetic fields is very close to this Hamiltonian density. Um, we just need to fix this value of the constant alpha sitting in there. And of course, we know that the Hamiltonian density should be the energy density. 
And here we're looking at the part of the Hamiltonian density that relates to the fields. So we fix the value of alpha so that these things uh, become equal. And we know that alpha, therefore, must be minus 1 upon 4 mu naught. And that guarantees that the Hamiltonian density is indeed the energy density of the electromagnetic fields. So that all works out very nicely. And of course, this pins down what our Lagrangian for the fields should be. It has to be minus 1 upon 4 mu naught of the contraction of the electromagnetic field tensor in this way. This has all the right properties. It's Lorentz invariant, gauge invariant, and then when we convert it into the Hamiltonian, it, has, it corresponds to the energy of the fields in the right way. So we can be pretty confident this is the right thing. And it turns out it is the right thing. OK, so let's try to work out the final part of our Lagrangian, the coupling between the electromagnetic fields and the sources, uh, which are the charge distributions and the current distributions contained in the four current. So we have to have some kind of coupling between the four current and the four potential. So far, we've just considered the fields in isolation and the sources in isolation of course, Maxwell's equations describe the coupling between those things, how they feed back into each other, and that's what we want to write down here. What I'm going to do here is kind of make an educated guess about what this uh, is going to be, and uh, in so doing, uh, we'll write something that has all the right properties down, and then uh, we can plug it into the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion and see what we get, and we'll find that it does indeed reproduce Maxwell's equations. So I'm going to motivate this with the following very simple example. It's a sim simple limit that we know must be true. It's that of a single static charged particle, Q, let's call it, in an electrostatic field. So I'm not talking about any currents. I'm not talking about any magnetic fields. I'm not talking about anything moving. This is a totally static situation. In that case, I know what the Lagrangian has to be. So in the electrostatic limit, I know the Lagrangian takes this very specific form. This first term here, um, in the non-relativistic limit, would simply be the kinetic energy of a particle. And uh, in the relativistic limit, we know what the uh, Lagrangian for a free particle is with no potential. So by the word free here, I mean um, it's Lagrangian uh, without the potential. Uh, and in special relativity, we know the result for this for a single point uh, particle, and there it is. This second term here is the contribution from the potential. And uh, the potential in electrostatics is the potential energy here. is minus q times the uh, electrostatic scalar potential, which I'll call phi here, evaluated at the uh, position of the point particle. So this is the potential. And uh, what we can see from the Lagrangian is usually you have kinetic energy minus potential energy, and so therefore appearing in Lagrangian, we get the free part, which is basically the kinetic, plus Q times the scalar potential. So we can kind of think about this term as being like kinetic, and this term being the potential, and we have uh, L is T minus V, essentially. So this is the result that we expect and we know is correct in the electrostatic limit and for a single point charge. So what is the action for this system? 
the action s is, of course, the integral dt of the uh, Lagrangian. I'm not writing down the Lagrange density here, just the Lagrangian. And let's just call this first piece here uh, S free. It's the free uh, part of the action. And then we have this extra piece, which is coming from the interaction between the charge and uh, the fields, which is uh, done here through the uh, scalar potential. And Q, of course, is just the charge, which is a constant. So let's call all of this term the coupling part of the action. Okay, so that's definitely the correct result in the electrostatic limit. How are we going to obtain the uh, action for the full electrodynamical situation? Well, we have our guiding principles. We have our guiding principles of locality, of Lorentz invariance, and of gauge invariance. And this action that I've written down here for, especially this term involving the coupling, is manifestly not Lorentz invariant. There's no contraction here of four vectors. If I change my reference frame, this is definitely not going to be uh, constant. And the reason, as we already explored in this very lecture, is that if I change my reference frame, we know that the components of the four potential get mixed up. So here I'm just involving one component of the four potential, namely the scalar uh, potential, phi. Um, and if I change my reference frame, this is going to change, and I'm going to get a different value of the action. So this is manifestly not Lorentz invariant, and we need to fix that if we're going to write down um, a full electrodynamical action. Another thing that I want to address is the fact that here we're considering just a single point charge, whereas in the end we want a continuum field theory. And so I will also want to replace the charge by a charge density over some infinitesimal volume element d tau. So the amount of charge in a region d tau is rho d tau, where rho is the usual charge density. And so if we make this substitution, we can actually look at a Lagrange density. So I will just write down that the coupling part of the action will be the integral of rho times the scalar potential phi, and then uh, integrated over the volume t tau, which I'll write dx, dy, dz and then integrated over time, as before in the action expression there, dt. And of course, what we see here is this integral over the four-dimensional space-time, as before, and therefore we can sort of extract the uh, Lagrange density. This is Lagrange density now. Uh, in the electrostatic limit, as just rho times the scalar potential phi. So what we now need to do in the dynamical theory is to come up with something that is uh, Lorentz invariant. This object we've written down here is valid in the static limit, but it's not Lorentz invariant. So when we're going to the dynamical case, we need to think of something that reduces to this in the static limit, but that has full Lorentz invariance. So in electrodynamics, we require Lagrange density corresponding to the coupling to be Lorentz invariant. And this thing that we've written down so far in the static limit is manifestly not Lorentz invariant. So let me just write down a suggestion for this Lagrange density corresponding to the coupling. I will suppose that the Lagrangian is minus um, the contraction of the four potential with the four current. So this is definitely a Lorentz invariant object because we have two four vectors and we're contracting the indices here. So this is definitely Lorentz invariant. And if I just write out 
what you get from this, we have the following. And in the first term here, you see magically that we get phi times rho as we want. But now for this to be properly Lorentz invariant, we have to subtract off a dot j, where a is the regular uh, three vector potential and j is the regular three current. So we've dreamt up here something that magically does the trick. It is Lorentz invariant, and also in the static limit, we know that it uh, has the right form. It has uh, the scalar potential multiplied by the charge density, rho. And so finally, we've arrived at the Lagrange density for classical electrodynamics. It involves uh, three pieces. The first is just the, uh, the free source uh, Lagrangian. So this is basically just the kinetic energies of the sources, something trivial that we know from classical mechanics. The second piece tells us about the um, Lagrangian of the electromagnetic fields themselves. And the third term tells us about the coupling between the sources and the electromagnetic fields, which takes this incredibly simple form. It's just the contraction of the four potential with the four current. So this actually turns out to be the correct Lagrangian. And uh, we sort of guessed the answer in various parts here using analogies between different things. Um, however, we can now demonstrate that this is the correct result by simply plugging it into the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion and seeing what we get. And the answer is that we get Maxwell's equations back. So we have this wonderfully consistent picture in the end. And this Lagrangian that I've written down here embodies the covariant formulation of electrodynamics, which involves these fundamental relativistic objects, the electromagnetic field tensor F here, the four potential A, and the four current J. Okay, so that's actually basically everything that I wanted to say about the relativistic formulation of classical electrodynamics and the Lagrangian formulation. This also brings to an end to this course uh, on electromagnetism. Um, I hope you found it interesting and insightful. And of course, there's many more things that we could say on this topic. It's a huge, rich and very beautiful topic, um, but hopefully this has been a good introduction.